Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Wednesday, October 9th. Four playoff games on the slate today, including one early matinee between the Tigers and Guardians. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris here with you, breaking it all down. Two teams on the brink of elimination. We'll get to them in just a few minutes. But because time is of the essence, you know, we are going right into game three between the Tigers and the Guardians. We talked a little bit about it on our Tuesday episode. I did the heavy lifting. <laughs> that's, that's not even fair. I took a moment to look at the usage of the Tigers pitchers from the first two games. And because of the off days, both between games one and two and games two and three, the conclusion I came to is pretty much everybody's available. Tarek Skubal won't pitch in this game, of course. He started through 92 pitches on Monday. He's going to be the starter for game five. If the series goes that long, so it'll be on regular rest. And maybe you could say that Reese Olsen, because he threw 73 pitches as the bulk guy in game one on Saturday, is someone they'd use maybe like an extra innings on Wednesday, and they'd like to have him as the bulk guy for game four on Thursday. So with a wide open card for the most part, AJ Hinch has a few options. I think you suggested Bo Brisky as the first pitcher up for the Tigers. He closed out game two, only threw 12 pitches, had the off day. What other options do they have? I've seen Cater Montero maybe as someone they could use a lot. Uh, he threw 25 pitches back in game one, so he could be used at least one time through the order, if not longer, if they want to. They could do something different. Uh, throw a short reliever in front of Brant Herter, who's only made one regular season start this year. They always seem to throw someone in front of Brant Herter. Lots of options on the table. What are your considerations, and what do you think they ultimately do in this matchup pitching-wise? I think you still have to figure out who your bulk pitcher is. And when I'm on Baseball Savant today, it says Cobb versus Montero. Mm. <laughs> Whatever that means. And <laughs> so if Montero is my bulk pitcher, then I want to go with Tyler Holton, I believe. Um, and I just want to play with that lefty-righty aspect to to begin with and see if I can't uh, push the other you know, push Steven Vogt around a little bit in terms of at least where he puts people in his lineup in terms of lefties and righties and maybe even who he puts in the lineup, maybe make him burn a bench piece uh, early on. So uh, that's uh, that would be the plan. Tyler Holton for, you know, three outs, four outs, depending on how he's looking and how it's going. Uh, Cater Montero for two and a third. You know, to you know, just uh, how many outs can you get one time through the order? That's that's three innings. So, yep. you know, so now you're in the fifth inning, and then it's uh, just a combination of Will Vest, Bo Brisky, uh, and Jason Foley for the most part to 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 get through the last uh, four innings. And I guess that means that each of your guys has to. Um, has to pitch more than uh, more than an inning, unless you kind of uh, judiciously use Sean Gunther, the lefty, um, which you can do even if he doesn't. If he finishes the inning, he doesn't need to do the three batter rule. Right. So what you do is, I think you uh, you you do a full inning with like a Bo Brisky or a Jason Foley. He starts the next inning if it's a righty. He gets the righty out, and if there's two lefties or two out of the next three are lefties, uh, that's when you bring in Sean Gunther to get through that, and then you you reset with the other righties after that. So um, Gunther might be a part of that. I mean, that's that's you know they 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 do this all. They 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 have a plan, and in fact, rights holders, people that are sideline reporters and and and, and people that are associated with the people that are putting this on TV will have a meeting with the manager a lot of times where the manager will tell them basically what the plan is and you know what order so that the rights holders know when to do a sideline bit when to do their bit on you know oh Bo Brisky has been a great starter and a reliever this year or whatever it is uh, they know how to set up the 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 even the guys in the booth know when to to, to tell their story about Bo Brisky so you know uh, it's, uh, that's kind of, you know, it, uh, what's weird too, is that sometimes they adhere to that plan, no matter how good someone like Tyler Holton could come out and get four outs in eight pitches and the plan might still go on ahead. 
It might. And I think part of that is this is the only stretch of the series where they're going to play on consecutive days. So you're thinking a little bit more about tomorrow with your relievers than you've had to at any other point in this matchup. And this Except is- that if you bank the win, you go up uh, uh, all important 2-1 and you could almost flub tomorrow and there'll still be another day, you know, whereas if you don't bank the win, then the worst case scenario is you use all your guys and you use them pretty heavily and you lose. That's the worst case scenario. Right, but they are mostly rested. We haven't seen Foley. We haven't seen Brendan Hanafy. We haven't seen Herder. We haven't seen Jackson Job in this series. I wonder if there is a spot where the Tigers would like to get Job out there, or if he's kind of the last guy they want to use. They put him in a pretty maybe, key spot in that series against the Astros, or maybe he's the guy if they're down one. Mm-hmm. You know, because you don't necessarily want to. You don't want to wave the white flag. Like th- that was the th- interesting thing for the Padres thing when they asked Dave Roberts after. The you know Bueller gave up six last night. He's talking a lot about waving the white flag and thinking about tomorrow and thinking about usage. And that's that's what they're, that's what they're thinking about is how many pitches can I use today in a loss or in a win and you know that sort of deal. So uh, I think Job would be the guy that come out, especially since he could probably give them two. So if they're losing you know three two in the sixth, you don't necessarily want to go to the Foley vest brisky package just yet so you might do job first yeah. see if you can get some runs together then go to that the, the final package I, I do think we touched on it a little bit yesterday but the the way the guardians handle the early innings is going to be more interesting today than it has been in the previous games because alex cobb has been hurt for most of the year he's only thrown 16 in the third innings in the big leagues so I get the sense we're going to see one or two more pitchers than we've seen from the guardians in the first couple games of the series, it makes me wonder which combination of Gavin Williams, Joey Cantillo, Eric Sabrowski, or Andrew Walters we're going to see as part of the bridge before they get to the big four, as we've called them. The, the you relievers don't think they'll they rely save Gavin on. Williams for, for game four? I, I kind of think they will save Williams because here, here's what I was thinking. I think the way the Tigers are built and the way they're platooning Kerry Carpenter with Justin Henry Malloy gives you a little more you can do if you're Steven Vogt to force the hand of A.J. Hinch, right? So I think if you want to go ahead and use Eric Sabrowski, who's a lefty behind Cobb, maybe you can pick your spot and get a matchup you really like. And the spot that would, would likely be, if you start Cobb, Kerry Carpenter's up around the top of the order, right? Because Cobb's mm-hmm. a righty, Carpenter's a lefty. You're not going to pull Kerry Carpenter early, but then what you're giving yourself is the opportunity that second time through when you're taking Cobb out of the game to match a lefty up against both Kerry Carpenter and Riley Green if they're close together in the order. So, so I think it's something along those lines. So, you know, you take what you can do is you can take Kerry Carpenter, put him lead off so that you make a pain point mm-hmm. for Stephen Vogt and the Guardians early on, which is. You've gotten through three innings. Alex Cobb is dealing. You think maybe we'll go second time through the order with him because it's looking pretty good. Oh, he's got Kerry Carpenter as the first guy he sees twice. And if you then take Sabrowski to, you know, reduce the effect of Kerry Carpenter or even maybe get him out of the game, then um, then you uh, then you've already gone to your bullpen. Yeah, you know, in the in the fourth inning, which maybe they're fine with. I mean, they do have a good bullpen, but in terms of depth, uh, you know, we may have a uh, uh, just the tiniest bit of disagreement between the two of us about how deep this bullpen goes. I know that they led the league in ERA, but um, I don't really trust Hunter Gaddis. I mean, this is a guy who coming into the season had a career thirteen percent strikeout rate. Um, and I know that the fastball velo went up a tick and a half to two ticks, um, and that some of this was him starting before. So, you know, this could just be a regular old, uh, you know, mediocre starter to good reliever conversion. But, you know, like a 106 stuff plus for a reliever is only slightly above average. And, and he's like the fourth guy. So if you go to Sabrowski in the fourth, you have to do, you have to pitch somebody that's worse than Hunter Gaddis probably. You, yeah, you're, and if you you're don't, going to Gattis, you're going to Gattis Smith and and um, and Kate Smith and and Class A to finish. If you want to save Sabrowski, you could throw Joey Cantillo and get maybe a little more length out of Cantillo mm. with the lefty and have him go through the lineup possibly once if everything's going well. But maybe you have him in from more than three outs. I think that's the other option you have 
if you're if you're in Stephen Vogt's shoes. But I get the sense it's going to be one of the lefties because they have more lefties than that. They still have Tim Heron, who is in their A core they can use later. And by managing it this way, I imagine AJ Hinch holds Justin Henry Malloy back as late as possible because they don't really like his glove. You don't want to use Malloy early as a pinch hitter and have his defense out there the whole game. So you're probably looking at like Malloy versus Heron sometime after the sixth inning as a possible situational pinch hitting spot where you're throwing him out there. Uh, so that's the the tactical thoughts around the pitching plans. I think in game three, both teams kind of cobbling it together. It just It just looks on the outside like Alex Cobb's a little more stable than what the Tigers are doing, but I don't think that's the case at all. I think they're almost in the exact same spot. Yeah. Yeah, it might be. I, I have... Uh, and a personal uh, uh, affection and affinity for Alex Cobb that may uh, cloud my judgment. <laughs> like honestly, just being honest, like he's he was one of my favorite people to talk to in the in the clubhouse. So yeah, you know, and I'm just that, like yeah, he can do it. <laughs> well, and Alex Cobb's story. I mean, I think if you ask Alex Cobb, hey, can you just talk about the injuries you've had in your career? It's like the scene in Forrest Gump where <laughs> Bubba's explaining all the ways you can prepare shrimp to Forrest. <laughs> That's Alex Cobb's injury history. He's like, you're talking, you're the, the, he's like, thoracic outlet syndrome, elbow surgery, shoulder surgery. The one hip, the second surgery on the one hip, then the other hip. Stockholm <laughs> syndrome. And you're like, wait, that, that's not an injury. And it keeps going. You're like, no, no, I want to talk about the Stockholm syndrome. But <laughs> what was that? <laughs> it's not a physical injury. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> but it's been a pretty, amazing postseason so far i think i saw our, our friend uh, uh, mike petriello say this maybe this is the best playoffs ever so far like but hard to put that out there but i think so far it's been it's so funny my first response to he had something like the that and my first response to his uh, tweet and i actually tweeted it was few because i thought that the first round was uh really boring i mean well at least in terms of like series they weren't series they were just sweeps but they were surprises. They definitely had plot twists, and we've had all four of these series split That's at one. That's true. One. I guess even a two-game sweep can be interesting because it's a it's an upset and it's a surprise. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Tigers, Astros, the, or the the Orioles dropping two at home to the Royals is a big surprise. The way the and Mets fact, got through, you know what what happened in that wild in that wild card round could be healthy for baseball because you could say, man it's not awesome being like the third best division winner or being the first wild card and just leaving early, you know, like it actually, maybe next year we'll buy that extra player and try to get to be one of the top two teams or win our division, that sort of thing. Well, I think that might be why Phillies fans are feeling so deflated today, right? The Mets are now one way, one win away from advancing to the NLCS and the Phillies don't have the same injury woes that the Dodgers have right now. You could look at the Dodgers and say, well, a bunch of the pitchers got hurt. They and have a whole pitching staff on the on the I.O. Right. And and you know, even though they they earned the first round by, they had the top seed, they weren't the team on paper at the end of the season. They were at the beginning. So, you know, whatever happens from here happens. They're just not that team. The Phillies are that team, and they're one win away. And you can kind of just feel the momentum going behind the Mets right now. It's on the back of Grimace, the left shoulder of Sean Mania that, that they've got to this point. I mean, Mania was phenomenal in game three, 19 swinging strikes. He outdueled Aaron Nola, uh, just the way we would have drawn it up back in March. But I did see a clip from before the game, MLB's uh, Twitter account put this out there. And our buddy Alex Chamberlain was kind of wondering if you use a pitching machine to replicate the release that Sean Mania has, but the machine doesn't replicate the movement profile of those pitches. Are you still getting the same benefit, uh, a, a better a better look at what you're going to see in the game, as opposed to something that might actually trick you a little bit because of the movement profile not being the same? I thought it was just an interesting question. I don't know if we have a, a real answer to it, uh, but it's one of those things. It's like how do you how do you replicate weird in a way that actually benefits you in the situation? If the Phillies had come out and put up four or five runs on Manaya and knocked him out of the game after four innings, the way people are looking at that clip is completely different this morning than it is after the way Manaya pitched in that game. I think there's some benefit to what they did. I know that it didn't work, but you know, I talked to Michael Morse. He tied the game off of the 
sideways slinging Cardinals right-hander whose name escapes me right now, but he tied the game off of him. And I asked him while someone was pouring beer down his uh, backside, uh, you know, during the during the celebration afterwards. How did you prepare for that moment? How did you come off the bench cold and hit a homer off the one of the weirder releases in baseball? And he said, "I played the game. Who's up? Who's up next? Who? When do I come in?" And I figured out that I would be facing him. And I went downstairs and I asked our 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 bullpen guy uh, downstairs to throw, you know, from that release to me. And that guy's not going to throw exactly like, you know, the pitcher that, that he faced that day. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it's not exactly the same, um, but it still helps because you're looking for that release. Um, you're looking for that release point. You can still, with that machine, uh, kind of, uh, kind of sp- spot it. I'm, I'm going to watch this real quick. Is it Neshek? Pat, Pat Neshek, yeah. Yeah, Neshek. So I think that's I think that was it. He I think he saw he saw that release point and he asked his his starter, his his bullpen guy to throw from that release point. So, you know, you're looking for that. You're at least looking in the right direction, you know. Whether or not the the, the pitch comes out exactly right. Now you're talking about machines being are, are machines even valuable at all, you know, because even uh the traject does not give you ball in hand all the way to the end like a human being. So you know. Well, and I think the the question we've wrestled with at times on this show is, you know, what is the value of traditional BP, sort of grooved pitches that you're able to just crush? There's sort of a repetition, getting the hand-eye calibration that you want, having that little bit of confidence, feeling getting your good. swing to feel right. Yeah, like the, yeah, it's more about feel than about replicating what you're going to see in the game in the way on-field BP has been done historically. But we're just seeing more teams try different things. I would be more on the side of maybe you would take a round to get that calibration right, take a second or third round that comes back and does something that's more like what you're going to see in the game. I think maybe there's a both is actually the answer of what you're looking for in getting prepared to play. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, You know, and then there's just a question of like what are what things are available to you in the facilities that you're in currently, you know you do you get access to their traject you know what do you have a do you have a bullpen guy who can throw from that angle you know like there's all sorts of uh questions that come to mind that's uh that's a way to have a unique skill that keeps you employed right there just develop (laughs) a funky arm angle and market yourself to major league teams as someone that can throw some bp the 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 game against the the phillies did inspire me to do a little bit of a a a little deep dive here and um you know, Pete Alonso uh, in the first thing, what you saw from the Phillies was a, a definite attack plan of trying to get to Nola's fastball early in the count. They were very aggressive early in the count. And Alonso kind of, uh, you know, started this off with uh, taking a fastball uh, the opposite way, which is, you know, the announcers were talking about this is when Alonso is good, this is what he's doing. But um, I also wanted to point out that when Alonzo is good, he's doing some other things. He's kind of a silly guy. So here he is holding the rally pumpkin. When they asked him what the rally pumpkin was all about, he said, it's a pumpkin. It's fall. And this is Donnie. That was Don. This is the humping. Alonzo did, did this, this humping thing that he was. That was his celebration for a while. It was kind of weird. That's the, the, the unicorn that he was doing. Him and Jesse Winker used to do this little weird unicorn thing when they celebrated. Um, and there was also the rally horse um, which, uh, you know, I think the, the Quattle bomb, I think their, their hitting coach had had this one for a while, but this is the rally horse. And th- at the very end of this clip, you'll see that Pete Alonzo, uh, he looks back at the camera and he just smiles this goofy smile, uh, after he pets the, the horse. And I, and I just think that this is, this is silly. Uh, one of the, the, the ones that went, one of the ones I went by quickly is they created a hitting coach, um, that they called, uh, Donnie. Donnie uh, Stevenson. They just made up this guy. And um, for a while in post games things, they were like, oh yeah, Donnie's our approach coach. Uh, he knows what it's all about. And uh, and so then they hired an actor to actually act Donnie Stevenson out. And that was the guy that uh, if you saw him, you know, you saw him in jean shorts uh, with a ripped dude in jean shorts, that was Donnie Stevenson, the <laughs> fake hitting coach that they made up. And uh, I know... Uh, you know, to some part, uh, some part of this is intentional. You know, it's just, um, you know, 
we need to loosen up a little bit. We need to have something to rally around. And uh, but that goofy smile at the end from Pete Alonso makes me think also like it's intentional in like a in like a fun way, not like a somebody up in the front office is like, ooh, you know, all the teams that have won uh, have had a rally animal. Like, let's get a rally animal down there. You know, stat, you know, PR, marketing, come up with a rally animal, get it down there, you know. And then it's like the rally pizza rat, and everyone's like, uh, yay, rally pizza rat. And sometimes, I think sometimes you get that with the home run celebrations. You ever get that where you're just like, okay, you guys, like, got a hat, and you, like, put it on, and, like... I mean, even the, the rally, like, spoiled sausage was, like, a little bit, like, you know, I was like, uh, this is, you know, what are we doing here? But I just wanted to highlight that Pete Alonso seems to, to hit the right tone with a lot of this, even when he's holding a nondescript pumpkin and, and fielding questions <laughs> about the rally pumpkin. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think part of it is having a group of people that are on the same page with how they, how they kind of, celebrate but also how they keep things from becoming too tense when things aren't going well mm -hmm. and i think that's maybe when you start to see some of the quirks of, of uh, the personalities the differences where some people are not into the celebration right if things aren't going well but you're supposed to do the celebration maybe the clubhouse is kind of fractured that's where i think you see some of that stuff coming well, out and right now i mean like the mets everybody's rowing in the same direction most well, teams in the I, playoffs are like that but you can definitely see it in that dugout right now I'd also, uh, you know, it's not necessarily pushing back, but like, you know, one thing that we have seen out of these Mets is a lot of different ones, right? So they had the Grimace thing and Pete Alonso was wearing the purple Grimace cleats, you know, <laughs> and then they have the OMG thing. And um, I would say that like, there probably are different factions in the clubhouse. You know, there are maybe people who like the OMG a little bit more, like that song, you know, there might be people who, who listen to different music and don't really like that song that much. But the cool thing is that they've kind of flooded the space with all these different things that I do think that there is a little bit of like, oh, well, you know, no matter what, when I celebrate, I can celebrate with something that that I like, you know, whether it's Grimace or it's, you know, the OMG sign that they have, you know, there's like there's different ways for me to be me in this clubhouse. So I'm, I'm kind of yeah. agreeing with you. But also, like, there are different ways. It's not just that they're not all on, the, all on the exact same page, but they're all they're all like, yes, like they're all pulling in the same direction and they, they all have their own way to kind of celebrate. It's kind of like if you just had a playlist and your captain made the whole playlist, people might not dig it quite the same way as if everybody throws one song onto yeah, it, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Who's controlling the stereo in the clubhouse? Well, that kind of depends on their personality and how much they want to share that responsibility with everybody else. But... This series, it, it's like one big swing for the Phillies away from going to a game five is what it feels like to me. And I think some people are going to say, well, they had the layoff. Maybe the layoffs negatively impacted them. I don't know. They scored seven runs in the game they won. So I don't think we can look at that and, and sit here today and say that's why things aren't going well for the Phillies right now. I mean, I think the Mets have played well. That's a simple explanation that satisfies me up to this point. Um, I think there's only a couple of like, carryovers that I'm really – Thinking about from game three, as far as bullpen usage goes, Carlos Estevez came to this game and threw 26 pitches. So maybe if he's laboring through a save opportunity in game four, that catches up to him a little bit. And the Mets were able to rest Edwin Diaz on the other side. So I think that's a good thing, given some of the struggles Diaz has had this postseason. I think less wear and tear on him this time of year could really only be a good thing. And looking at the starting pitching matchup for game four, Ranger Suarez versus Jose Quintana. Quintana pitched really well in that game that sent the Mets through the wild card round last week in Milwaukee. He exceeded my expectations in a lot of ways. And I guess I'm, I'm getting to the point now where I'm having a hard time doubting him the way I did earlier in the year. But this seems like another tough matchup for a Mets starter that actually favors the bats the Phillies have. So it's just going to be having a good game plan, maybe finding a way to quiet that crowd early if the Phillies are going to come back and take game four. Yeah. And, you know, you're throwing Jose Quintana out there um, as a lefty. Uh, you know, I, I just scanning the team. Um, I was surprised to find that the Phillies were third best in baseball this year against lefties with a 118 WRC plus. 
and I, you know, I clicked through to see who was so good. And, you know, Kyle Schwarber, left-hander, 153 WRC plus against lefties this year. Bryce Harper, left-hander, 151 against uh, lefties this year. So I thought that those two left-handers, you know, kind of maybe not necessarily neutralizing them with a lefty starter, but but you know suppressing them a little bit would make this team more approachable because the the big right-handers are Trey Turner, uh Nick Castellanos and JT Riomuto with some bone like those are good right-handers but they're not on the level of Schwarber and Harper at least in terms of power threat. But if Schwarber and Harper are coming off such a great season as lefties, I don't know uh that Quintana necessarily does uh much to to uh negate any of that. The Mets were fourth best with a 118 WRC plus, basically tied with them against lefties. So um, I don't know that the the left handedness of the starters today is super relevant. Other than you may get Austin Hayes in this game um, for the uh, Phillies, at least to start the game. He hasn't appeared yet, but I think he's on the roster. He's been dealing with a back issue. Uh, but if he feels OK, this is why you got him. You know, so mm-hmm. uh, Austin Hayes may be in the lineup. I don't know for the Mets. Um, I mean, it's JD and Winker kind of sharing a spot right now. So I think JD would start, and you know, yeah. later in the game, we'd probably see Jesse Winker again. And and Jesse Winker just wants you to know he hates Milwaukee, which is <laughs> it's like, dude, you were hurt and you had a horrible year. If you didn't say anything about it, people would forget how bad you were here. But now everyone here is going to remember how terrible you were for that one year. It's his choice, but. Just a weird. I mean, weird I, one. I I talked to him a few times that year, and you know, I do have a little bit of sympathy for him. It's just that you know, when when you're hurting, but in a way that allows you to play, uh, that was something that happened to me in my baseball career uh, once, and you know, I took an immense amount of poop for it. You know, for my play looking pretty bad, and I was like, yeah, well, I have a, kind of a fractured bone in my foot. Like, yeah, playing just, hurt is it like not uh, playing. It it doesn't get you the the curve it should in most cases because the results <laughs> yeah, dip like so no much. And... Kind of maybe nobody cares because they're like, yeah, well, my thing hurts too, and that thing hurts, and like you know, we're <laughs> all kind of hurt. Like so, yeah, you, you just know. don't get a lot of sympathy from even your own fans in situations is that like the, that. Is that like a Friday Night Lights thing? Are you hurt? Or are you injured? Uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> In any case, uh, it's just a little bit of sympathy. I, I understand that uh, his celebrations could uh, could in Milwaukee in particular could rub people the wrong way. Uh, I don't know what's what's the is there another move that they make? Is Harrison Bader in this lineup over somebody? Marte maybe higher in the lineup. Marte was lower in the lineup against uh, righty last time. Yeah, I mean you got Bader and Tyrone Taylor are, are both righties, so I don't think there's a looks like a platoon situation there. It's just who do you prefer to play? Um, but yeah, it's this seems like a close to even pitching matchup, but one where I would probably lean Suarez if you said pick based on the starters. Yeah, yeah, and it is an interesting thing that you know one from the from just you know behind the curtain a little bit. I think that where we tend towards, and most people that are picking games tend towards who's the starter, where's the starting pitching, um, you know, advantage, and I'm going to start my my picks my my sort of process there and that becomes less and less powerful the 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 less the starters pitch <laughs> mm-hmm. if we're gonna oh we're like oh so ranger suarez is better than jose quintana picking the phillies there we go and they both throw three innings and you're just like oh dang it <laughs> right yeah you're usually making that pick based on like a five inning sort of assumption now it's more of like a three or four inning assumption so you start whittling away i kind of think that. the phillies uh take this one and 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 send it to game five um if anybody's interested in some advanced reading if that is the case uh i had a piece up today about kodai senga and where his stuff sits uh as he returns it the vila wasn't there and the cutter wasn't there um and so there's a couple of questions that senga still has to answer that may be surprising to you um after a what seems like a good debut uh in the in game one so i think it'll go game five and uh i think it'll be it'll be a fun series it has been already that's what i've been sitting on uh, the entire time philly's actually getting to and winning the world series so it's not great to have them on the brink of elimination quite this early but that's the situation that i'm in 
Let's move on to Kansas City, where the Royals are hosting the Yankees in Game 3. It's Clark Schmidt against Seth Lugo. I'm going to stand by my flyby prediction from Tuesday, the random dumb prediction that a misplaced sweeper to Bobby Witt Jr. is going to find the bleachers. That's how Bobby Witt Jr. is going to wake up in this series. But I do like that we've seen Clark Schmidt in these last two seasons really develop into a pitcher who has four pitches that he's throwing against hitters on both sides of the plate. It's a pretty big step for him. He's got the cutter, the sweeper, the sinker, and the curve. You know, that's a good mix overall. Um, I wouldn't put a lot of stock into just how great he's been on the road because it's a small sample. He missed half the season with an injury. He's also showed reverse splits this year. I wouldn't put a lot of stock into that. But I do think Clark Schmidt is a little bit of an underrated starter. And this is another case where, yeah, we're probably shortening up our expectations for starting pitchers because that's what it is in the postseason. But I think this is a closer matchup than people might realize on the surface. I mean, I think Yankees fans know what Clark Schmidt brings to the table. I think fantasy players know. But I think a lot of folks who aren't in one of those two buckets might not be familiar with him and might be underestimating him based a little bit on just how good his opponent was over the course of the regular season. Lugo was phenomenal, and Schmidt only got about a half season in because of injury. Clark Schmidt, there we go. I've got a 3-7 ERA projection for him uh, using Stuff Plus. And for Seth Lugo, I've got a 4-14. Hmm. So uh, that's an interesting thing is that uh, a model that looks at traditional the numbers and Stuff Plus would pick Clark Schmidt over Seth Lugo despite the seasons that they've had. So Clark Schmidt took a really good step forward this year in lefties. He had a 380, 363 slugging this year against lefties, Clark Schmidt did. Uh, last year was a 500 slugging. Um, for his career, it's a 457. So he really changed his approach against lefties this year. And I don't know how important that is in this particular matchup because most of the Royals' thump is from the right but uh, it's nice to know that uh, he has a plan for Massey and Melendez, at least. Um, and because he's so dominant sinker sweeper against righties, I actually think he's going to suppress the offense in this one. I think this might be a low scoring game. Yeah, I mean, it should be by all accounts. We did have Seth Lugo match up against the Yankees twice during the regular season. I was looking at his pitch mix in those two starts. He changed it up pretty good. Uh, one of those starts was a really good one, a 5 nothing win in September. The other was a 4-2 loss in June. That was actually in Kansas City. But I wouldn't be surprised if he used another wrinkle because that's what Seth Lugo has. It's just an almost an infinite com number of combinations of how he can mix and match. I think it was more cutters the second time out, if memory serves me correct. Um, but I, I think like a, it was a new pitch for him this year that he learned late last season in a, in a bullpen with Ruben Niebla as a member of the Padres before he knew he would never pitch again as on the Padres. It was a, it was a goodbye parting gift from Ruben Niebla. So. It's a pretty nice yeah. gift. I mean, it's better than a watch, right? <laughs> yeah. It's the kind of thing that can get you to buy more watches for yourself later. Aaron Judge has got to wake up, man. I mean, I, I'm not not worried. It's kind of like my we, reactionary New York fan. He's got to wake up. I mean, yeah, yeah he, he will, right? Is there any reason? Is there, there's no reason to think he won't. No, <laughs> but he's got to, it's got to, it's got to do it. All right. Who wins this game? Yankees. All right. You got the Yankees. I think I'm going to take the Yankees in this one too. I start to think this series is going to go five though. I mean, they'll have a chance. They'll throw Cole in game four though, right? They'll have Cole on regular rest. Yeah. Which. And at home. It'll be in you know, Cole, oh, Cole oh, in game four being Garrett Kansas Cole. city. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Cole, Cole Reagans would go game five. Mm. Mm. I think the Yankees are going to win this series. Yeah, I didn't go to the World Series, so hopefully they can uh, find a way. But I, I do think Judge gets going. And there's just not there's not a lot in terms of questions I have about them right now. I think if they put themselves into an elimination situation going into Thursday, the conversation might be different. But I do think Clark Schmidt, despite a mistake to Bobby Witt Jr., will pitch overall very well in this spot. It's a very specific prediction. I know. I needed a specific <laughs> prediction. It, it, they never land, right? I mean, that's, that's Bobby too, Witt homers on an errant sweeper. Low scoring <laughs> But the Royals game. lose anyway. The Yankees win. <laughs> Witt's great. The rest of the lineup is bad. And you know, you, know, you know who makes a prediction like that? 
Someone who's played fantasy baseball for a while. <laughs> right. Someone who's built a DFS lineup or has been in a yeah. situation where they needed an exact outcome. Like, I'm throwing Clark Schmidt against the Royals and I have Bobby Witt on my team. So I need Witt to do exactly well, but Schmidt not to get smashed. Like, yes. I need a solo homer. <laughs> that is how my brain works after 20 years of, of this game. <laughs> Looking at the nightcap, the Padres have an opportunity in game four to eliminate the Dodgers. You mentioned that this a little bit earlier. That was the game, dude. It's so strange. I mean, Mookie Homer's in the first. The Padres hang six and, in the second. And Mookie Homer's to the place that he homered when Profar stole it. Profar's there. And mm -hmm. because Profar is Profar, Mookie almost abandons his run and <laughs> actually get like uh, almost hits the pitcher's mound between first and second before his coach says no 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 you hit a homer get back and he has to go back to second base <laughs> he like draws a heart on the infield uh by the way i guess by the rules the umpire could have declared that he abandoned his run but there's there's no precedent for that and it just it would have been it would have been ridiculous it would have been a pretty bad application of a rule yeah. that doesn't really get applied ever but it, but i actually felt bad for mookie because it, it it stole the thunder of so he <laughs> had his thunder stolen so ridiculously the first time that this time even after he, he kind of got the homer he's like yeah yeah okay and then he did the, <laughs> he did the like, <laughs> dodger thing he's like okay yeah yeah <laughs> but, <laughs> but it you looks know, then, then the Padres come roaring back, and Tatis hits a homer that just explodes Petco. I mean, mm. just, just the sound was deafening. I had friends in San Diego; the, their ears were done in by it. You know, it's just like just din, just absolute pandemonium. And and then Tasker Hernandez hits a grand slam in the next inning. So you know, you're like, oh, it's going to be one of those games. You know, right. It's going to be 11 10. It's going to be back and forth. They, They're going to empty both bullpens. It's going to be a slugfest. It's going to be a major hangover going into game four. <laughs> yeah. They Someone's going to be just dragging. In, yeah. Everyone's going to be dragging going into game four. Nope. They, they interviewed Dave Roberts after the third inning or so when it's six to five. And he's literally talking about waving the white, white, white flag. Now he's saying we're not waving the white flag yet, but he. In, he's used the words. Hey, like the, the 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 interviewer didn't use the words. He came up with those words. Oh, you're talking about white white, white flag, huh? And and he said, well, you have to think about who's pitching today and who's pitching tomorrow and who you want to have available tomorrow. So they left Walker Bueller in when it was six to two or whatever, six to one, whatever it was. They left they him left, in after he got smacked, and then they six, left him they in left after him they rallied. They got smacked because they thought they'd lost the game. Right. And that's why I was so surprised. There were a couple of instances where I was like, Walker Bueller is still in this game. I put it in the Discord. I think it was the top of the order came back up in the fifth, and it was a 6 5 game. face a lefty when the top of the order came back around. Yeah. I mean, Bueller appeared to talk himself like to stay in the game, even mm -hmm. at one point when Roberts went out there. And I just thought, wow, this is. This is bold just in the sense that it's a one run game. You can still come back and win this. And if Bueller gives him a couple more runs here, you are going to be second guessed and judged into oblivion for that choice, given how yeah, if you lose poorly eight, to start six, with. Eight, seven after, after you leave him out there. Yeah. But to his credit, I mean, he stuck with his guy. Bueller made a couple of nice pitches. And got then there's through just it. no more offense. It's crickets for the rest of the game. It's six, six to five. Yeah. The bullpens on both sides were great. And I don't really think you saw anyone get used to the point where they wouldn't be available for game four, which is really important for the Dodgers, especially because they're using like a full bullpen approach behind Landon Knack. And then. The Padres will use Dylan Cease on short rest for the first time in his career. So you have to think a quick hook is possible for him as well. So that's Suarez, kind of floating out there. Suarez went four. He's done that a few times this year. Um, you could do something where uh, you flip it and Suarez does, you know, gets an out or two and Tanner Scott goes four. Right. You might just choose the matchups for, for that and let that guide the process. There's there was one play in particular um, that was fa fairly interesting from a rule standpoint, and I'm not the biggest rules jockey, so I had to read up on for this a little bit. But um, there's a point at which Manny Machado is at first base and he's running to second base, uh, and Freddie Freeman fields the ball, and this is where Freddie Freeman hit Machado with the throw, um, and that turns a double play-ish or at least a an out 
into no outs and Manny standing on third. That was a that was a kind of a big switch in things. Mm -hmm. And um, when Manny is hit by the ball from Freddie Freeman, he's he's on grass. So if you think about it, he's running from first base to second base, and when the ball hits him, he's on grass. That means he ran into the throwing lane for Freddie Freeman, and he probably did it on purpose. Now, the 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 rule book says. Um, you know, people are like, oh, what about establishing the baseline? He ran out of his baseline. The baseline is established in a tag play. So mm -hmm. there's a tag play wherever you are when the tag play starts, you draw basically a straight line to the base, and that's your baseline. You've now, the tag play establishes the baseline. Now, there is a rule that says that a runner may not interfere with the fielding of a thrown ball. But... In order to enforce that, the umpire needs to know that it was an intentional thing. And so the way that it works, the way that it's enforced in baseball normally is if the runner looks back. Yeah, I was going to say, that'd be one of the only easy cues you'd have to really understand a runner's intent. So if a runner looks back and then runs into the play, then you can say he's out. But in this case... And that's why I say I think Manny did it on purpose. I can't know. Well, there's and a the coaching. Umpire couldn't know, and so yeah. the umpire didn't call it. But there's a coaching aspect of this of of like choosing to run into that space based on where you saw the ball get hit without looking back. Exactly. Right. That's the tactical. And Manny's an infielder who knows. Mm -hmm. He, he kind of knows what's going to happen, where that ball is going to. You know, he can he can see it before he actually has to turn around and look at it. So yeah, but yeah, if you don't look back, they don't have any real like obvious proof that you chose to do that yeah I, I saw a lot of takes of like oh you know he's out of the baseline well that's not the right rule i saw some takes oh the the umpire looked the other way that's not the right take the umpire is looking for something specific to enforce it and that i think is literally the the runner turning around looking yeah so the question for you for game four, how long does Landon Knack work into this game? I don't know that I would be throwing cease, but maybe the idea is go for the jugular and you know, a Martin Perez bullpen game is not necessarily going for the you know, going for the jugular. Right. Your your choices are the yeah, act. You go you go Martin Perez and your bullpen, or you push cease by a day, maybe use your A bullpen instead of your A and your B bullpen, and then you have a rest day. And if you need game five, you have Darvish on regular rest. That's a pretty good alternative to saving cease and maybe not ending up using Darvish at all. That'd be kind of a weird way to have it play out. Like if you were to not use cease in game four, go to the bullpen, lose, and then have to choose between cease and Darvish in game five, one of those guys doesn't pitch a second time in the series potentially. Yeah, and or they pitch did, less. When did Cease pitch last? Would have been game one, right? Of this series. Yeah, it would have been Saturday. So in that game, I'm trying to see how many pitches he threw. They got him out pretty quick in that game. I, I yeah, was surprised by that hook. Third, 82 pitches though. It wasn't. It wasn't the most. So, I mean, it wasn't, he didn't go 110, you know, it wasn't, you know, in terms of number of pitches, it wasn't, you know, one of the bigger ones of his career. He is their best pitcher. Yeah. So I think, I think I agree with the decision. I think you're doing it knowing that if you see fatigue, if you see anything that concerns you at all, you're giving him a relatively quick hook anyway because you did that in game one on full rest and that's part of just the difficulty of the matchup it's part of the quality of the roster that you have it's part of what you can do tactically to optimize your chances of winning knack i mean if we saw knack for more than three innings i'd be a little surprised it's not impossible i think we like what he brings to the table skills wise but i would get the sense that this is much more of a all hands desperation vibe in in terms of how quick they're going to flip the switch if they don't like what they see from Landon Knack. How how far how deep does your trusted bullpen go? I mean, I think Trainin, Vessia, Phillips, Kopech is four. Hudson's probably in there. That's five. Yeah, and he, th he threw like what four pitches yesterday in, in game three. So you got at least five. 
But those are really five guys, but they're not five guys that maybe Kopech could give you depth, you know, um, innings, like in terms of four or five outs, if he's pitching well, like if he's commanding the ball, you know, right? so it's, it's a really like, you have to watch to decide if he can go far. But I would say from the five of those, I think the most I, I could, I could get is six innings. I mean, the, yeah. So I think you're hoping for a minimum of three. You're probably not expecting more than four unless your offense erupts and you can push it a little bit. But I still don't think they'd even push them that deep, even if they had a big lead because of the circumstances. Get three. That's where it gets hairy. That's where you're in some trouble. Yeah. Because then you're bringing out, I guess, Anthony Banda, who pitched okay, but I don't know how much I trust him. Or a rookie like Ben Kasparius, because you want a lefty out there. Ryan Brazier. I mean, there's some there's some okay pitchers. It's it's probably not as bad as some other people's depth relievers, but um, that's that's the Padres' game plan. Is you got to chase Nat quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Is this one going five, or do you think the Padres actually end it on Wednesday night? I think. The Padres- I know you got him winning the series. I think the Padres could end this. I mean, I like Knack, but I like Cease more. And then I like the the back end of the, the, the Padres bullpen more. And between Cease and Knack, who do I think can go four innings tonight? It's Cease. You'd still bet on Cease even on short rest, being more likely to go four. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense based on what we've seen from Dylan Cease. The race to four. That's what it, that's starting pitching has come to. Who can go four innings tonight? You know, you know, there are so many old players just shaking their fists. They're so <laughs> mad at home watching this. And something about that brings me a little bit of joy. <laughs> it's like, the game changes. What are you going to do about it? Like, this, we all have a little bit of troll in us. <laughs> we all, even, even if you don't want to, we all have just, just a little bit. Thankfully, I've got a, li- a lot less than uh, Jesse Winker, though. That's that's all that matters. <laughs> I think this series, and I think <laughs> the Padres take care of it. Jesse Winker somehow. All right. Man, it's just uncalled for, man. Just uncalled for. We are going to go, as Eno mentioned earlier, you can check out uh, his column, plus all the other great baseball coverage we have on the site, athletic.com slash rates and barrels. $2 a month gets you in the door for playoff baseball. NHL starting up. NBA is just around the corner. NFL in full swing. College football. Whatever you're looking for, we got great coverage of that. Be sure to follow us. On Twitter, Eno is at Eno Saris. I'm at Derek Van Riper. The pod is at Rates and Barrels. And join our Discord with the link in the show description. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you on Thursday. Thanks for listening.